Well, good evening. It's uh, August the 16th, 2020, and we're continuing our Sunday night study, our, our idea of building blocks for the Christian life. And we've talked the last couple weeks, and I'd encourage you to go back and watch them if you haven't, on how to develop a worldview, and very specifically, a biblical worldview. And we've talked about the importance of what a worldview is. It, it's the guideline that you live by. It's the things you practice, whether you call it that or not, that determine your life and your steps and your actions and your reactions. We looked quickly at the idea of authority, the views about God and salvation, and those distinctions that lead us to a biblical faith and building a biblical worldview. Now, I said in the beginning that the first three or four lessons was going to be laying a lot of groundwork. And then we're going to get to a lot of scripture and talk about imp applying those biblical principles to our worldview. And one of the dangers of talking about a Christian worldview or building a biblical worldview is I need to remind you, unfortunately, that there's a significant number of people who call themselves Christians who have never claimed the new birth. A lot of people call themselves Christian because they're not Jewish. They call themselves Christian because they're not a Muslim. But that doesn't mean they hold to a biblical framework for their worldview. So I want to suggest a few contradictions today to help you see the difference between a biblical worldview and what, for lack of better words, I have to call a, a worldly worldview. Now, many of these people call themselves Christians. Many of them may have experienced a new birth, but have so drifted so far that their worldview is just built on shifting sand. I would contrast for you, friends, the difference between a Bible-based and a liberal theology, if you would. Number one, if you're building your worldview on the Bible, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. We believe that thus saith the Word of the Lord is the Word of the Lord, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, that the Bible is the Word of God. Now be careful, there are many who come and they claim that the Bible contains the Word of God. There are many who say that the Bible becomes the Word of God and that man judges the book. But I want to challenge you to build a worldview, a biblical worldview. We must believe in an absolute authority. And that authority is that the Bible is the Word of God. Secondly, we believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son in a sense that no other is, can be, or ever will be. Jesus is unique. He is the only begotten. Many of our liberal friends would argue that Jesus is a son of God in the same sense that all men are sons of God. You see the stark contrast there, don't you? Believing that Jesus is the one and only uniquely qualified God the Son or he is a son of God just the same way that you and I can be. Thirdly, we believe that the birth of Jesus was supernatural. We believe that God used a virgin woman and through the power of the Holy Spirit, she was with child and that Jesus' birth was supernatural. There are many theologians today who would argue that it didn't have to be a virgin, that it was just a young woman and, and maybe she just raised this child and, and they lay aside the deity of the virgin birth and they argue that his birth was just natural. We believe the birth of Jesus to be supernatural. Fourthly, I would argue with you that the death of Jesus was a substitutionary. We believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus took our place and that he's the substitute for the penalty for our sin, for the wages of sin is death. And Jesus bore that on the cross. There are many liberal scholars who claim to be Christian who believe that well, the death of Jesus was exemplary. It was just a good example. But it has no real relevance to my salvation. Jesus was an example, not a substitute. We believe the Bible teaches that man is the product of special creation. We believe that God is creator and that he formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Sadly, there are many in the Lord's church who claim to be Christ followers who simply believe that man is the product of evolution. 
There are many pulpits who struggle with the introductory chapters of Genesis because they have bought into the lie of evolution. We believe that man is a sinner, fallen from his original righteousness and apart from God's redeeming grace is hopelessly lost. Many of our liberal friends would say that man is simply the unfortunate victim of his genetics and his environment. That left alone, man will do fine. That left to his own devices, man will rise. That cream rises to the top, but yet we understand very clearly that fallen man does not rise without God's redeeming grace. We believe that a biblical worldview demands that man is justified by faith in the atoning blood of Jesus. And that the result of that is a supernatural regeneration from above. You must be born again. Many of our liberal friends would say this, that man is justified by works in following Christ's example, and that results in a natural development from within. Many years ago, I was saddened to watch an interview with uh, the Archbishop of a major area in Europe. And he defined two ways to become Christian. One is what the Bible would refer to as the new birth, and the other is to just simply grow up and absorb its principles and claim its values. Well, I want to say that Jesus said you must be born again and that that supernatural regeneration must take place from above, not from within. Man left to his own natural development will die a horrible death. Works cannot save you. It is an act of grace. But if you have a Christ-centered, Bible-based worldview, it affects every part of who you are. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want to challenge you as we continue to lay the groundwork for what a worldview is to understand all the principles involved, the authority, the, the view of God, the view of salvation, the view of, of the foundational beliefs of Christianity, they all hinge and they all affect every part of your being. You see, a lot of people say, well, I want to pick and choose what scripture I believe. The Bible doesn't give us that option. You have a distorted worldview, certainly a distorted view of scripture. Paul said, for me to live as Christ and die as gain, there was a missionary martyr named Jim Elliot who said this, he is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And there's one other foundational principle we need to discuss, and that is this idea of Christ versus culture. And if I can just take a moment, lay a little bit of personal background here. I, I took an ethics class at uh, seminary back in the 90s. And the Monday-only group of students that took classes were largely pastors. We were all a little bit more conservative than some of the uh, full-time students on campus. We mostly were serving the Lord in adjacent states and counties, and we made an effort to be there on Monday, and we'd spend the day taking classes, drive home late at night. And they assigned the most liberal professor at the seminary to teach that Monday-only ethics class. And I was excited. I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard. And I'm going to win. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get an A from this guy, whether he wants to give it to me or not. And, and I will tell you, the students in the class, we had a good time. We tried to engage him. We, we tried to have fun. We weren't disrespectful. There was, there was no question, however, that the professor had an agenda. And I had an A average going into the final. And, and very honestly, my, my daughter was born the weekend of the Monday-only final. And uh, I honestly have no recollection of getting home from school that day. I saw the grader at the convention that summer, and he said that uh, I wasn't the only person who lost a full letter grade on the final. <laughs> so, so I ended up with a B in that class, but that's all right. Uh, my daughter's been more of a blessing than that class was. But we have to ask the question, how do we think Christianity relates to the culture? Now, there's only so many options, and, and historically one of those options is what's called Christ above culture. It is the idea that all things divine are up here, and culture is down here, and Never the two shall meet. That we in the church need to just let the world fall apart because we hold to these higher values that are up here. They can't affect us down here. We don't have to live out our faith in the world. We don't want to try and change the world. We don't want to reach the world because 
The things of God are so holy. Now that's a ridiculous position to take. It's contrary to so much in the scriptures. But every once in a while, that very uh, liberal, uh, experimental idea will raise its ugly head again, and some people will say that we should just leave the world alone and just isolate ourselves in communes or whatever. Now, many hold to the idea that they long to see what, what would be called Christ in culture, that the culture and our society be ingrained in the church, and that everything culture does is tied into the church. And let me just challenge that notion because um, if you honestly believe that's a good idea, move to South America. Uh, where the uh, Roman church controls the political nature of many of the small towns. And many of the uh, districts are largely controlled by the bishops and the archbishops in those areas or the cardinals. Uh, if you are really of the opinion that uh, you would like to see uh, the church have a voice in every aspect of culture, maybe move to Utah, where uh, so much of the Mormon church influence is clearly seen. I think we need to be very careful, though, that we give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, but to God that which is God's. And Jesus challenged us very differently when he said, give to Caesar, but give to God. And I think it's a dangerous blurring of the line when we just assume everybody's Christian because they live in our culture. Or we assume our church should control the culture. Baptists have always been in favor of pluralism. Now we're we're not endorsing false religions, but we've always believed in the autonomy of the individual to believe their own convictions. Free will, if you would. Then there are really two other possibilities, and I think these two blur together to help us find the right balance. The first idea is Christ against culture, and this is, this is that perpetual uh, perpetual wrestling match that takes place, that the things of God are, are just so contrary to the things of the world, we're always colliding, and we're always seeing a tension. Now, there is always a tension, because the things of God and the things of this world are very different. But we often see Christians who are just looking for a fight. But for us to have an impact, we need to understand that we are called to face persecution, that we will see tribulation. And that we should stand up strong. Uh, there's a, a big push the last 15, 20 years, theological circles, for the discipline of apologetics, to be able to defend the faith in a pagan culture. And I think this is a lot of influence in this. And I, I think there's some great truths that, that bleed out of this, but we need to be careful not to look for the devil every aisle of the grocery store. We don't have to fight every time we have a discussion with people. We are not the enemy. Jesus is the victor. And I think the best attitude towards it, and I think we, we recognize that we are against the culture, but I think we have to look at the idea of Christ for culture. This is the idea that we're called to be ambassadors. This world is not my home. Uh, we do not belong to this world. More specifically, I represent Christ to a lost and dying culture. More specifically, I understand that only Christ can change the world, and sometimes hammering them may not be the best approach. But I must be diligent in sharing the message. Christ for the culture. I believe that Jesus can redeem my community, my county, my state, my region, my world. I believe the gospel of Jesus is that powerful. So we've tried to lay the groundwork. We have to understand the authority that we declare for our lives. We have to understand our beliefs about God and salvation and truth and the applications of that truth. And we have to determine how we believe our worldview based on Scripture should impact the culture. Now, starting next Sunday night, we're going to unpack some of this a little slower. And we're going to talk about the biblical worldview and the need for it in our culture today. We're going to talk about the practical applications of applying our biblical worldview in every situation, in every action and reaction we take. I hope you'll be able to join us next time. If you have any questions about our church or if you'd like to learn more about following Jesus, let me encourage you to go to our website, fbc-sellersburg.org. You can read about the gospel. There's a click on our homepage that'll take you to it. I challenge you to look to the word of God 
to determine your worldview and to serve the Lord Jesus where he's called you to serve. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you've blessed the listener. Encourage us, Lord, as we grow closer to you. Help us to understand your word, apply its principles to our lives, and to practice personal holiness in a world that so desperately needs to see Jesus. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.